Hello everyone, this is Dr. Tony Evans with The Urban Alternative, and I'm excited to welcome you to join us on a journey. A journey through Hebrews 11, it's known as the Hall of Faith, where men and women discovered what God can do when God's people learn to live, walk, and act by faith. The beautiful thing is, it's not just about them. It's about us. As the author of Hebrews writes to New Testament believers, that's who we are, about how the lives of Old Testament saints who learn to live by faith should challenge and affect our lives as we live by faith. So we're excited to welcome you on this journey. It's gonna be an exciting trip. We're gonna learn a lot. Most importantly, we're going to be transformed by the truth of what it means to be a kingdom hero who lives by faith. Today, we're going to talk about the leading candidate of faith in the Bible. If I were to use football language, you would call this guy a beast. Because when it came to faith, he is the creme de la creme. He is the, he is the superstar. He is the most valuable faith person. In fact, when the Bible wants to talk about faith, he is a constant illustration of it. Hebrews chapter 4 and the book of Galatians chapter 3. He keeps talking about this guy. In fact, this guy is such a beast. He is such an illustration of faith. And his name is Abraham. Abraham is called the father of the faith. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 6 to 9, it says, and when you learn to live by faith, you become one of his children. You become an heir to Abraham, who was the superstar of faith. And if you learn what we go over these next three weeks for this one personality and his wife, you will enter into a realm that perhaps will be brand new to you and to an experience with God that will uh, be fresh, not stale, because you have learned to live like Abraham lived. In Hebrews chapter 11, we read in verse 8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived in an alien, as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. We're going to learn three things about Abraham today and his walk of faith. That if you want to experience God at a whole new level by faith, it will involve a leaving, a living, and a looking. If you want to experience God as you've never experienced him before, as you move by faith, it will involve a leaving, a living, and a looking. Let's start with the leaving. Because verse 8 tells us, by faith, when he was called, he obeyed by going out to a place. Now, this is described for us in Genesis chapter 12, chapter 13, when God told Abraham, I want you to leave your city, your community, your house, and even your people. And I want you to go to a place that I'm not going to tell you about yet said he didn't know where he was going. All he knew is God told him to leave without knowing where God was taking him. Why is God telling him to leave, Ur of the Chaldees? Why is God telling him to, to move away from family and friends and the things he grew up with? Well, to understand that, you have to understand chapter 11, the chapter that precedes God calling him. In chapter 11... The whole world has rebelled against God. A man named Nimrod, uh, an African that you shouldn't be proud of, led the whole world in rebellion against God. 
the Tower of Babel established the religion of humanism, man-centered religion. It says that they gathered together as one people to build a civilization and right in the center of the city they built a tower that is a ziggurat, that is a worship steeple. And they said, we will build our tower to the heavens. We don't need God. We've got intelligence, brains, reason, science, technology. We can build this thing ourselves. We don't need God. We don't need God to help us. In fact, we're going to build this thing so high, we're going to show God we can get to him. Of course, Genesis 11 says, and when God looked down and saw what men were doing, he came down. So I don't care how high you get, how much money you make, how much notoriety you amass. God's got to come down because you ain't getting but so high. God came down and said, now look, look at them fools. Look, look, look at what they're trying to do. It says, they are seeking, God said, to build a name for themselves. Why? Because they don't want to carry my name. God says, I have, a, I have something for you to do. I've got a plan for you, Abraham. But in order for me to fill my plan, you've got to leave here. In other words, stay with me. If you want to see where I want you to go, I'm not going to show you where I'm taking you till you leave where you are. You cannot stay here and have me. You cannot stay around paganism and have me. You cannot stay around humanism and have me. So you've got to leave and you've got to trust me that I know where I'm taking you even though I'm not telling you. See, a lot of us are like this. Okay, God, show me where you're taking me and then I'll let you know if I'm going. God says in 1 John 2 and John 15, he says, if you are friends with the world, you are an enemy of God. And he tells that to his disciples. If you, if you hang out with the world, you can't have me. God has called every Christian to leave worldliness. He's not called us to leave the world. That is to, to not live in society, not work in society, not, not, not have responsibility in society. No, but worldliness is different. Worldliness are attitudes and actions that leave God out. You're worldly when there are attitudes and actions where God is dismissed from. God has saved us out of this world. The world is not, as we've said many times, a place. The world is a philosophy. It's like uh, the world of finance, the world of fashion, the world of politics, the world of sports. While they involve places, they're really an orientation centered around a certain thing. World of finance is about money. Well, worldliness is about the exclusion of God. The enemy wants you to exclude God and God says, leave there. That is, your life and my life cannot be defined by leaving God out or just putting him in piecemeal when we like it as a spare tire, taking him out the trunk when life goes flat, putting him back when we can roll on up by ourselves again. You will never know where God is taking you unless you leave where you are, the world. You will never find out. He will, he will never show you what motivated him to leave. God said, I have an inheritance for you. Says he left to get his inheritance. An inheritance is like a will. It's something bequeathed to you. God has something for every believer here. If you are a Christian, he has a purpose that he wants you to fulfill. But he will not show you your destiny if he can't leave, get you to leave the world. As long as you're hanging on to the world, you're at enmity against God. God cannot communicate with you. So you won't hear heaven talk. You won't get answered prayers. You won't get direction. You'll be aimless because your affections are not with him. They are elsewhere. You visit him on occasion. But you live with affections and actions that leave him out. 
In fact, one of the ways you know you're growing as a Christian is when your passion for the world is dying and your passion for him is growing. If you're loving the world more than him, that's because the world has your affections, it has your passions, it, it, it has grabbed you. So he says, you must leave this paganism that doesn't include me without me giving you all the details. You're going to have to walk by faith and believe I know where I'm taking you. The problem was, or is, that that's where he was born. That's where he grew up. That's where all his people are. That's where his businesses were. The Bible says he was a filthy rich guy. That's where all of his activities were. So it's hard to leave something you've grown up in. Because that's, that, that informs your frame of thinking. But it says, when he heard the voice of God, he obeyed and left because his inheritance was more important than his current location. So here's the decision we have to make. That is, if you really want to experience God, is what God has for you more important than where you are? Do you love the world so much you're willing to lose your destiny? Because God knows where he wants to take you. But you must be willing to leave. Say goodbye. Because God knows where he wants to take you. But you must be willing to leave. Say goodbye. Some of you are going to battle because you're going to have to say goodbye to that worldly relationship that's keeping you from your destiny. You may have to say goodbye to that, that worldly scenario where the guys are going out after work and they, they, they talk in smut. You find yourself comfortable there and you don't want to lose a friendship. And we're not talking about being antisocial. We are talking about saying that that does not fit where I'm trying to go. And so because that doesn't fit where I'm trying to go and I want to get to where God's taking me, I'm willing to make, I'm willing to leave. It's going to be hard to leave, but, but I'm willing to leave. Because you can keep yourself from ever hearing the voice of God if you stay in the world. There, that system that leaves God out. Hebrews 13, 13 says, you must go outside of the camp where Jesus is. Jesus died outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was where Judaism was. He went outside the camp and died. It says, you can't stay in just a religious environment and not be willing to be identified with Jesus Christ and bear his reproach and expect to hear from God. You have to go outside the camp. That is, you, 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 you can't be just part of the system. He based his life on a promise. Unless you leave the old, you will never discover what God has for you in the new. So the question is, what do you want? Do you want him or you want to hang out where you are and not have him? Because he will never coalesce with the world. James 4. He won't do that. So the first thing you need to know is that your life of faith will require a leaving of worldliness. Desires and actions that are in conflict with God. Secondly, your life of faith from this superstar of faith will involve a living. A leaving and then a living. Notice this, verse 9. By faith he lived, see that? By faith he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. Wow. He left and then he lived. Now watch this. It says he lived in the land of promise as a foreigner and an alien. Wait a minute now. Wait a minute now. Watch this now. He left. He left Ur of the Chaldees, paganism. He is now in the land God is promising him. Okay? God promised him a land. But in the land that he's now in and living in, He's living as an alien and a foreigner 
in the middle of a promise. Some of us are in God's waiting room. And there's probably no greater discipline in the Christian life, no harder discipline than waiting. God, how long is this going to take? When are you going to come through for me? How come I take two steps forward, three steps back? How come every time I look like you're getting ready to do something, you flip on me and the thing doesn't work out? God is always doing two things at one time related to your life and mine. Here are the two things. He's preparing the promise for you and he's preparing you for the promise. Okay? He, whatever your inheritance is, whatever your destiny is in time and eternity, but, but this is time, whatever he has planned for you in time is being made ready. But he's also got to get you ready so that when the promise and the plan and the destiny is realized, you don't mess it up because you weren't ready. Now watch this. You have no control over the promise part, over the part that, that's not you. God is doing that over here. You can't control that. You have a control over the person part. So on my side and your side, we could be delaying the promise while waiting for the promise. And that's exactly what happened with Abraham. Watch this. Genesis chapter 12, chapter 13. Abraham is 75 years old. 75 years old. His breakthrough doesn't come for 25 years. It's going to take him 25 years for God to break this thing through. That's when Isaac appears. So one of your major reasons to want to leave Ur the Chaldees, the world, and want to live in God's presence and move quickly in obedience is so you can get what he has as soon as he can give it because you're ready for it. God, why is that such a big deal? Because God doesn't want to give you a destiny that will cause you to forget him. He says, as a foreigner and an alien, the Bible says that you and I are foreigners and aliens here. So watch this now. God does not want you to be too attached. A foreigner is somebody, they're there, they're not fully attached. See, he was in the tent. That's not a permanent location. God is moving them from this place to this place to this place to this place to this place. God says, if I'm going to take you to your inheritance, I've got to develop you for your inheritance. And when I develop you for your inheritance, keep your shoes on light because I'm going to send you through some stuff. I'm going to take you through some things. There are going to be some mountains. There are going to be some valleys, but they're all divine, designed to develop you. I got my peace out here. I'm going to take care of. I just got to get you right. Some of us are working on 50 years of things that should have been solved in three years. But God, but, but we didn't pitch our tent and built us up a house that we ain't going to move out of. And so God does not have flexibility with our lives. And so he can't grow us like he wants to grow us because we're not available for him to do his thing. But it says, by faith, Abraham was willing to live as an alien, to live as a, as a foreigner, not become too attached looking for God to change his scenario. And then the third one is a looking, verse 10. For he was looking, it says, he was looking. For the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Wow. If, 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 you, if you miss everything else, don't miss this because it will change everything for the rest of your life. He left the world. He no longer associated with that which, lead, lead God, which left God out. He lived in the arena of the promise but stayed fluid because he had to grow in that situation. Because before God gives you destiny, he always deals with development after having provided deliverance. So it's deliverance, development, destiny. And then it says the way he survived and the way you and I survived was where he looked. While he was living on earth, while he was waiting for the promise that was going to come on earth, namely a son born out of his old age, 
While he waiting for this, and, and it says he kept his eyes on heaven. He looked for a city whose builder and architect was God. That, that's, that's the heavenly city. Okay, watch this. He wasn't going to heaven yet. He still had a lot of years to live on earth. But even though he wasn't going to heaven, he was looking at heaven. Because here's the secret. If you learn to look at heaven, you'll live better on earth. If you stop looking at heaven and only look at earth, you will be looking through bad glasses. Because you'll be living like this is all there is. And this is not all there is. In fact, this is so small a piece of the pie. God wants you and me to have an eternal perspective. He says, I want you to look to heaven while living on earth. There are two extremes as a Christian. One is to be so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. The other is to be so earthly minded, you're no heavenly good. Like Santana Holmes in Super Bowl 43 when he won the Super Bowl for the uh, uh, Pittsburgh Steelers and he went to the edge of the end zone and he leaned up and he caught the ball in the air with his feet firmly planted on the ground. The winning touchdown. If he would have missed the ball with his feet planted, incomplete. If he would have caught the ball but his feet not planted in bounds, incomplete. He had to reach high and touch low. God wants you to look up while touching down. Your feet firmly planted on the ground, but you're looking up to heaven as you make your move so that heaven is informing earth. And when heaven informs earth, you can make it on earth because now you're getting supercharged. You're getting from up there joining you down here so you can make it from tent to tent until your change comes, until God brings the breakthrough, until God shifts the situation. That's why the Bible says in 1 John 2, this world is passing away. Watch this now. Don't hang on to this world too tight. See, that's why things get boring, because this world is passing away. That's why the drug addict has got to get more. That's why Satan offers more. He always ups the dosage, because he knows this thing is passing away. So he got to up the dosage to keep you going and craving it. God says this world is passing away, so don't hinge your whole life onto this wagon. Because it's passing away, and guess what? We're passing away. So since this world is temporary, look eternally and it will change your temporary movement. When you lose sight of heaven, your perspective will be ruined on earth. If your mind leaves heaven and you only live for earth, earth is all you'll get. But if you are heavenly minded, Colossians chapter 3, seeking the things that are above, if you have a heavenly perspective driving you, you'll be ready for heaven and you'll be okay till you get there. Because he kept looking eternally, although he was living physically. It has to do with your perspective. There needs to be a shift in your perspective. There's got to be a shift in our perspective that you wake up in the morning thinking eternally. That is, thinking God's perspective, that a spiritual worldview. This has got to be how you live. This is how he lived by faith, thinking heaven while functioning in history. Genesis chapter 12 and 13, guess what you find? Over and over and over again, when it tells the story of Abraham in Genesis 12 and 13, it says everywhere he went, he built an altar. An altar is a worship place. He didn't just go to church. He carried an altar with him. So every time he was in a new situation, he built himself a worship place so he could keep his eyes on heaven in the middle of earth while waiting for promise as he was trying to develop. He said, God, it's you and me now. He can't pick up his altar, go to another place. Hey, worship. He picked up his altar. So if the only time you worship is on Sunday, you leaving your altar at church. The idea is to keep a spiritual perspective until God joins you in destiny having left Ur of the Chaldees. God says if you will leave where you are, if you will move and you will move toward me, 
keeping your eyes on King Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, he will know how to get you home and take you to where you ought to be. If you will leave the world, live under me, and look toward me, I will deliver you home. So the question is, you want to keep hanging out in the world? Or do you want to discover your destiny? But the only way to get there is by faith. Life is not an event. It's a journey. It doesn't start and end in a day. It's experienced over days, months, and years. We call a lifetime. In this journey of life, a lot of decisions have to be made. And a lot of them have to be made by faith because we don't know where things will result. We don't know in advance how everything's gonna work out. Abraham made a pilgrimage of faith. He was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. Since we have to go on this journey anyway, we need to make the pilgrimage of our life and our life's journey one of trusting God because he alone knows where things are going to wind up. God knows what you're like. He knows our propensity and he has compassion when we come home. Come back home as quickly as possible. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So whatever inheritance, whatever God still wants to do for you, to you, through you, in you, don't lose anymore. Jesus Christ broke the curse. So don't ever talk about you being cursed again if you know Jesus Christ. The curse, the consequence of the law is broken. The greatest miracle of all is when you dip yourself in the blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life. How many of you like puzzles? Anybody like putting together puzzles, okay? Well, today we're going to have a puzzle. And we're going to see the protrusions and the indentations of this puzzle come together to address the issue of irreversible consequences. Can they be reversed? Is there the possibility that things could be different although they look like they can't be? Gehiza is Elijah's servant. Elijah has just instructed Naaman how to be healed seven times in the Jordan. Naaman dips down seven times, comes up totally healed, and then turns and offers Elijah money, clothes, silver, gold, well worth in today's dollars over a million dollars. And Naaman says, Elijah, because you gave me the secret to this healing, I'm going to make you a millionaire. In verse 16, Elijah turns him down. I can't take your money. I can't take...
It's not about that. And he turns down the money. Gehiza sees him turn down the money. To which Gehiza says, you got to be out of your mind. You didn't heal this man. You offered him well over a million dollars and you're going to turn it down. So when Naaman leaves, Gehiza goes after him. When Gehiza catches up with Naaman, he says to him, my master sent me. And he told me to catch up with you because we got two seminary students. He calls them sons of the prophets. We got two students who, needs, who need a scholarship to get through school, who need some clothes because they poor seminary students. And so he sent me to get a little something, something from you. Let me have a talent and some of the clothes. So before I get any further, let me tell you what's going on now. The Bible calls it the sin of covetousness. Covetousness is desiring and plotting to take something that is not yours to have. That's covetousness. A synonym for it is greed. Going after something that is not legitimate for you to have in an illegitimate way. Colossians 3.5 calls covetousness idolatry. It is the worship of another God because you don't believe your God is the source so you go to an illegitimate means to get it. Covetousness. Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, about the covetous man. You don't have to turn there. He said, be aware of every form of greed. It comes in different shapes, in different forms. And you know you're a covetous person when you plot to get something you're not authorized to have in an illegitimate way through deception. He says, Elijah sent me. Elijah didn't send him anywhere. Not only that, but there was a fundamental mistake that Gehiza made. He said, Elijah sent me. He uses Elijah's name. He uses God's name. But he leaves out a phrase that Elijah said when he was offered the stuff. Because in chapter 5, verse 16, Elijah said, as the Lord lives before who I stand. Before who I stand, it means to whom I'm accountable. 
In other words, Elijah knew he was not just accountable to other folk. He was accountable to God. And God would see what he was doing, even if no man saw it. So Gehiza says, Elijah sent me, and as God lives, but not before whom I stand. He lost sight of a divine accountability. So he comes and he says, show me the money. I got some seminary students here. Elijah sent me to help. Naaman is glad to oblige. So Naaman goes and Naaman uh, and hands it to Gehiza, two talents, some clothes. Gehiza goes, takes it to his house and hides it. He then goes to Elijah and Elijah says, where you been? Gehiza says, I ain't been nowhere. Elijah says, did not my heart go with you? When you went to Naaman and when you connived to get this, how you know this? Elijah has scoped him out. And this is what Elijah tells him. Therefore, verse 27, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and to your descendants forever. So he went out of his presence a leper as white as snow. Let's look at the consequences of his decision. Consequence number one, a personal curse, leprosy. And it was incurable and unreversible. According to Leviticus chapter 13, verses 45 and 46, when you got leprosy, you now had to move outside the camp because it was contagious. So you, would, you, would, you, could, you could give somebody else leprosy and there was no way to fix it. It was irreversible. As we saw last week, uncurable. This is the Tony Evans Training Center, an online platform of courses featuring compelling video and audio teaching by Dr. Tony Evans. Thanks, Beth. Designed to expand both your biblical knowledge and thinking on relevant societal issues. These courses challenge and build leaders who speak out in love. Welcome to our course. Our mobile app allows you to stay connected to videos, audio, and reading material, and gives you the ability to interact with other students. This is on-the-go learning in community. Whether you have time for a deep dive or bite-sized learning, have a good run, babe. these courses can go where you go at your speed. Our oneness in Christ can make all the difference in the world. Life is busy, but Bible study is still possible. The Tony Evans Training Center. Explore the kingdom anytime, anywhere. Perhaps there's somebody here today who feels like you're living under a curse. This thing won't go away. It's affected every area of your life. There's no cure. You are a leper. No solution. But not only that, he says, you shall be a leper and your descendants. Not only that, he tells them it'll never change forever. Let's fast forward to chapter 8, verse 1. Now Elijah spoke to the woman whose son he had restored to life, saying, Arise and go with your household and sojourn wherever you can sojourn, for the Lord has called for a famine, and it will even come on the land for seven years. So the woman arose and did according to the word of the man of God, and she went with her household and sojourned in the land of the Philistine seven years. At the end of seven years, the woman returned from the land of the Philistines, and she went out to appeal to the king for her house and for her field. Now the king was talking with Gehazi. 
the servant of the man of God saying, please relate to me all the great things that Elisha has done. As he was relating to the king how he had restored to life the one who was dead, behold, the woman whose son he had restored to life appeared to the king for her house and for her field. And Gehazi said, my lord, O king, this is the woman and this is her son whom Elijah restored to life. When the king asked the woman, she related to him. So the king appointed for her a certain officer saying, restore all that was hers and all the produce of the field from the day that she left the land even until now. I got a question. What in the world is Gehazi doing in the palace? What is he doing in the palace? This boy is a leper. Leviticus chapter 13 verse 44 and 45 says lepers have to be segregated from the congregation. But now he's talking to the king. And if you're going to protect anybody, it's going to be the king. Not only is he talking to the king, he is a liaison between Elijah and the king because he now has a job. He's still called the servant of Elijah. So he's standing between Elijah and the king when he's been condemned to be outside due to leprosy. Well, come on now, I need some more pieces to this puzzle because chapter 5 and chapter 8 don't make sense. Enter a woman. A woman whose son had been raised from the dead.
We're told in those first few verses of chapter 8 that this woman, the Shunammite's uh, uh, son, was raised from the dead by Elisha. In the first three verses of chapter 8, you see the phrase seven years, seven years, seven years, and seven is the number of completion. Over a seven-year period, the woman is first meets Elijah and gets a miracle, the raising of her son. Seven years later, she comes to the king. What happened in the seven years? Oh, another piece of the puzzle. There's a famine. In chapter 6, verses 25 and following, there was a great famine in Samaria. While he's talking about her, okay, wait a minute, I got to put this puzzle together. I got a leper who appears no longer to be a leper. I got a woman, I got a prophet, and I got a famine. How do these pieces hook up? How do these pieces come together? How is he talking to the king like nothing is wrong? How does the woman show up while he's talking about the woman? Why does this seven-year gap show up? Chapter 7, verse 3. Now there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate. And they said to one another, why do we sit here until we die? In other words, we're in a hopeless situation and we're just sitting here waiting to die. If we say we will enter the city then the famine is in the city and we will die there. So we go there, there's nothing to eat there, so we're going to die there. But if we sit here, we're going to die here. So we are dead men regardless. Now therefore, since we're going to die anyway, why don't we go to the camp of the Arameans if they spare us and we live, if they kill us, we're going to die so we're going to die anyway, so let's go over there to that army that's against Israel and let's ask them if they'll give us some food. They may kill us, but we're going to die anyway. We're in a catch-22 that's unfixable. So they arise at twilight and they go into the camp because the camp has food. This is the enemy of Israel and they're keeping food from Israel. Verse 6, for the Lord had caused the army of the Arameans to hear a sound of chariots and a sound of horses, even the sound of a great army. So they said to one another, Behold, the king of Israel has hired against us kings of the Hittites and kings of the Egyptians to come against us. Therefore they arose and fled in the twilight. When they took a chance, they discovered God had already gotten rid of the problem. If they would have stayed outside and done nothing, they would have never discovered what God had already done. He had already scared the Aramean army so that they fled. And when they fled, well, I said, stay with me now, stay with me now. When they fled, they left all that stuff behind. Because when they fled, the lepers come, verse 8, they enter the tent, and they ate and drank and carried from their silver and gold and clothes and went and hid them. And they returned and entered another tent and carried from there also and went and hid them. Verse 9. Then they said to one another, stay with me here, we are not doing right. This day is a day of good news. But we are keeping silent. If we wait until morning light, punishment will overtake us. Now therefore, come, let us go tell the king household. Rewind. When he, Gehiza took that which was not his to take, Elijah says to him, just before he sentences him, is it time?
for you to have silver, gold, clothes, this, that, and the other. He said, it's not wrong that you wanted it. It's wrong that you wanted it in this time. He said, it's not time. Whenever you have to connive to get something God has not given you, it's not because it's necessarily wrong to have it. It's not your time. When you have to be illegitimate to get it, that means you run into maybe a content problem, but definitely a timing issue. Because when the Bible says God gives something, he gives no sorrow with it. So if you gotta be, if you gotta be, be manipulating to make it happen, then what you have done is that you have misused the time. But now, this table has been laid out because God had gone before them and cleared it up. So that now there's all this stuff, but they, they, they say, well, no, let's get this for ourselves. Let's take this for ourselves. And then one remembers and says to the other, three, no, 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 no. Been there, done that. What I'm telling you is that these four lepers are Gehiza and his sons. Go back. You're going to be a leper and so will your descendants. You got to connect chapter 5 with chapter 8 and somebody's got to explain how he's now in the king's court with no issues and contagious. And how does these four characters, the king, Elijah, the woman, Gehiza, and then this central event, the famine, hook up so that he's now in the king's court. It's comparing scripture with scripture. The reason that the names are not given is because he's living under a curse. What's the point? What is the point? Over and over again in chapter 8, seven years, seven years, seven years, seven years, seven years, the time of completion. Oh, let me give you another word for it. It's called retest. A retest is when God creates the exact same situation or a similar situation to it to see whether you learned your lesson. It's called a retest. You know the one thing I loved in school about retest? That means the teacher was giving me another chance. It does not change my previous grade, but it gives me hope for a better tomorrow because it's a retest. Notice it's the exact same situation with the exact same stuff. Silver, gold, money, clothes. He says the problem, Gehiza, is it's not time. Meaning another time, it will be time. But it's not time now. He gives him a retest. If you are in an un or irreversible situation, you ask God for a retest. Lord, give me another opportunity to take the exam again. And God will test and retest and retest again, then a retest on top of the retest until you get the message, till I get the message, till we get the message. Wow. Elijah prophesies at the end of the seven years that the drought's getting ready to end. The drought's getting ready to be over. He prophesies that, that it's coming to a conclusion. But the officer of the king says that ain't going to happen. That ain't going to happen. This, 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 this drought's not going to come to the end like you're talking about preacher. So Elijah tells him in chapter 7, he said, look, not only is it going to come to an end, you're going to see it, but you're not going to benefit from it. Now, look at the end of chapter 7, verse 17. Now the king appointed the royal officer on whose hands he leaned to have charge of the gate 
But the people trampled on him at the gate, and he died just as the man of God had said, who spoke when the king came down to him. Verse 20, and it happened to him, for the people trampled on him at the gate, and he died. Wait a minute. When we come to chapter 8, Gehiza is talking to the king. Wait a minute. He's now the liaison. He not only get his job back because he's called the servant of Elijah, he's now the one that the king is leading on for information. The same thing that the royal officer got to use. Well, wait a minute. When the royal officer got trampled, that opened up a job opportunity. And so now the king is leaning on the former leper to get information. He now has two jobs. He's the servant of the Elijah and he's the information center for the king. Because if God's sovereignty allows it, not only can he reverse your leprosy, he can give you opportunities that you never thought could be in your life, in your world, and in your future. So God is a God of retest. Have you ever felt like you've run out of options? <laughs> You get up and go, it's gotten up and gone, and you know, you, you look through the tunnel, and it's all dark, except for the oncoming train coming your way. Hope is gone. You're throwing in the towel. You resigned. It'll never get better. I've got good news. In spite of how bad it looks, in spite of how bad you were, <laughs> to bring it to the point it's at now. The sins, the mistakes, the failures, the rebellion, and um, you don't even know how to spell the word hope anymore. You've really set yourself up for God to do um, a reversal. He has a boomerang principle that he loves to operate with his children. When you looks like you've gone way out of the way, he knows how to turn that thing around and bring it back and change your situation. I know it right now looks like there's no way out. I know it looks like right now for many that you've been consigned to a life of rejection, of failure, and it's unrecoverable. That's where God does some of his best work. That's where God literally changes his mind when we change our direction. So even though it looks like it is impossible, and it is as far as you are concerned, and as far as people are concerned, but since there's nothing impossible with God, if you're still here, you're still alive, you're still breathing, then you go for that return because God is able to, uh, how shall we say it, make dry bones rise again. He can take the grave and bring life out of it. He can take yesterday's disasters and turn them into tomorrow's blessing. You don't give up on God because guess what? He has not yet given up on you.